everyone. Happy Monday in January. We are the Light Gate. We are coming to you live from the beautiful city of New Orleans, Louisiana, at the United Public Radio Network at 107.7 FM and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. We are on Roku, YouTube, Facebook, and many other different platforms. We have a wonderful guest tonight. We have lots of pictures, so those of you on radio with us tonight, we will endeavor to explain everything. I also want to let everyone know that we are in a part of the country right now that are being hit by hurricane force winds and very bad storms. We've done everything we can to remain online. We're off grid and uh, our batteries are holding, but that doesn't mean the Wi-Fi will. If the Wi-Fi drops, don't run because our producer is going to graciously intercede and come on with us. And uh, well, instead of pressing it on and carry our guest all the way through. With that stated, let's get going. To you, Preston. <laughs> Thanks, Dolly. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight on episode 37 of The Light Gate. We're just moving right along. I'm Preston Dennett, your co, your host. <laughs> <laughs> My lovely co-host is Dolly Safran, fully conscious UFO contactee, subject of my book, Symmetry. We have a really wonderful guest tonight who I'll get to in just a second, but I do want to say a quick hi to all you lovely folks here because it's because of you that we are able to do this show and are having so much fun talking to so many people who've had experiences, researchers, contactees, and all different kinds of interesting people. So big hello to you, Louise. Thanks for joining us tonight. And Lunar Dove, hello. And hi, it's Alicia. So glad you're ready. I'm ready too. I always get a little nervous. Don't know why. I've been doing this for 35 years. I should be used to this by now. But what? Whatever. <laughs> Hello, rat food. <laughs> oh, gosh, the Bayside Mall. OK, if you want to ask about it, we can certainly comment on it. <laughs> uh, all questions are welcome. Hello, Ruth Kleiber. Thank you for joining us. Octopus with no friends. We'll have to get you some friends somehow. But we're certainly all friends here. Um, who else do we got going on here? UFOs, gods, and extraterrestrials. Dolly Saffron is in chat. Look at that. Okay, I always mispronounce this, so I'm going to try real hard. Ala Listar. There, I think I got it. Thanks for joining us. Namaste. Oh, my gosh. You are just beyond generous. Thank you so much. Really, really helps out the show. Can't thank you enough. That is so awesome of you. Hello, Michael. Hope you are doing well. And Chris, pause. Team. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Christine, for joining us. And Janice Conant, always nice to see you here. Oh, Lunar Dove, you guys just you. feel so humble and warms my heart. Thank you so much for your generous, generous contribution. Who else we got going on here? Videos from underground. Synthetic Nature, Raven's Cloud, the Empath. Oh, empathy is such an important quality. Hello, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Star Orchid, John P. Adventures. Gosh, we got a nice big crowd today, Dolly. Very excited. Yes, thank you. Allison Carr and Cheryl and lots of other people. Ah, Raul. You are so generous. Wow. You guys are just beyond amazing. Thank you so, so much. Hello, Jason Bardo and Susan Alloway. And here's another difficult to pronounce name, Dejeskra. Hope I got that right. Dennis Whipple. Nice to see you here. AD Dances. Oh, I'm going to start put that question on a star so we can get to it later. And Dana, thank you so much. Gosh, you guys, that is so awesome. And Real Badger. All right, that's enough. I don't want to waste any more time because our guest is so amazing. And in fact, let me put up the banner so you can get a little bit of a preview about who we have on tonight. It's a researcher I've been following for a very long time. And his name is Christopher O'Brien. 
And since 1992, Christopher has investigated that this over 1,000 paranormal events reported in the San Luis Valley, which is located in South Central Colorado and a little bit in North Central New Mexico. And boy, if you've ever got a chance to visit the San Luis Valley, it's one of the biggest hotspots, really, definitely in the United States, but not the world. And not just UFOs, all kinds of really interesting stuff. Now, Christopher has worked with law enforcement officials, ex-military, ranchers, and an extensive network of sky watchers. And from 1992 to 2002, he documented one of the most intense waves of unexplained activity ever reported from a single geographic region of North America. And in fact, his 10-year investiga investigation resulted in three books, The Mysterious Valley Trilogy. First book's called The Mysterious Valley. I have it somewhere in my bookshelf. The second one is called Enter the Valley, which I have right here, actually, in my little hands. Secrets of the Mysterious Valley is the third. And there are other books. His meticulous field investigations of UFO reports and unexplained livestock deaths, Native American legends, cryptozoology, secret military activity, and the folklore is all found in the world's largest alpine valley and has produced one of the largest databases of unusual occurrences gathered from a single geographic region. It's currently working with a team of specialists installing a high-tech video surveillance and hard data monitoring system in and around the San Luis Valley. If you ever go to Colorado, you have to check it out. This is very close to where the UFO watchtower is located. Well, it is by Judy Messaline. Christopher's 2009 book, Stalking the Tricksters, distills his years of field investigation and research into an ingenious unified paranormal theory that is sure to create intense interest and controversy. And his latest book, Stalking the Herd, get this 600 pages, you can use it for weightlifting, is being called, quote, the Bible of cattle mutilation books and has received dozens of positive reviews. And it's the first book on the subject that objectively examines the unexplained live, livestock death phenomena, which remains one of the most perplexing mysteries of our times. Of course, in addition to his books, he's written many articles for such publications as Open Minds, Fate Magazine, UFO Universe. Oh, I miss that magazine. I used to get articles published in there too. But UFO Encounters and many others. And parenthetically, he's also an accomplished musician. Of course, he has many media credits, including Coast to Coast, and pretty much all the other major radio shows and podcasts, and is a frequent guest on all kinds of television programs. You've probably seen him on Ancient Aliens or Weird or What, Conspiracy Theory, UFO Hunters, and many others. I and mean, he's worked with Sightings, Inside Edition, Extra, Showtime's Sci Friday Chronicles, UFO Files, Exploring the Unknown, The Unexplained, Secrets of, Profiles in Ufology, Unexplained Mysteries, and many others. I mean, I could go on. He's the recipient of two EBE Film Festival Awards. That's a very high honor for people in this field. And he has also hosted his own regional Colorado New Mexico radio show called The Mysterious Valley Report. That was from 1996 to 1999. And of course, he's published the bi-monthly Mysterious Valley Report for about seven years, 1993 to 2000. He is a very sought after speaker at UFO conventions. So we are truly lucky to have him tonight. You can find his links in the description, but we've certainly got a lot to talk about. So let's just bring him on. Boom. <laughs> Hi, Christopher. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, good to be here. I'm excited. Yeah, I've been following you for a while since we talked, actually. I think last time was uh, on the Paracast. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. cool. I think pretty much that was it. Uh, <laughs> or I may have talked to you. No, I think um, I think we emailed back and forth um, about a case uh, that you were working on and and or a case I was working on, I think, and I, I may have picked your brain on it. Uh, we yeah, occasionally we we've, uh, we've we've run across each other online as well. So good good to be here. Uh, I'm glad to hear that show's taken off and uh, 
hopefully uh, we won't have any interruptions tonight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, I'm yeah. An eye on the radar as we speak. <laughs> well, you you've got a real you got a double barrel shotgun coming at you. Well, you know, weather these days, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really unpredictable. Unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> I have been to the Mysterious Valley, actually, um, a couple of times with nice. Stephen, Stephen Greer, held a couple of his groups up there. So uh, <laughs> I definitely was up there at least twice. And when I was a kid, we went to this great sand dunes. Yeah really a cool spot if you ever yeah, have a chance to that's about as spooky as it gets out there boy yeah well, i mean i love it i actually considered moving up there but you know i just can't take the colorado winters i can't yeah. do it <laughs> yeah with me it's the altitude now um i was just there uh, doing a shoot with uh with one of the popular shows that's on i'm not supposed to talk about it but uh I'm, I'm never going to go back there and do a shoot in, in late De or mid December at night. Um, it, it, it was just brutal. I, I, I had for the first time ever in all the hundreds and hundreds of shoots that I've done over the years. Um, I've never walked off camera uh, with, with cameras, with a dedicated camera on me. <laughs> I, I just had to walk off and they, they, they were like, you know what are you doing? You can't do that. Yeah. I, you your, know, your left hand is messing with your computer mic. I can hear it. Your left oh, hand is too close uh, to your computer oh, mic. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, yeah, I um, I said, well, it was either that or have me on on camera control. You know, with shivering uncontrollably uh, to take your pick. Uh, <laughs> so, so I had to go warm up. Um, Wow. It's, not, it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, I, I saw, you know, 40, 40 below in, in the valley. And, and uh, that winter, I saw 50 below. Wow. Uh, that was it outside of Gunnison uh, after New Year's Eve, actually. The first uh, first day of 91, we had uh, 50, 50 below zero uh, in the Gunnison area. Uh, oh, it's yeah. not, not for the faint of heart. And and plus, if you're, if you're faint of heart... Uh, with things that go bump in the night, maybe it's not not the best place to go either as well. So. <laughs> it's so beautiful, though. I think of yeah. any state in the United States, Colorado takes first prize. Yeah. It's one of the one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Yeah. It was great walk, walking out on the porch and seeing that <laughs> every day, yeah. seeing well, those congres. Yeah, I very yeah. seriously considered Crestone just because it's right there next to the National Forest. It's got yeah. Mount Blanca. Yeah. It's a, Beautiful, beautiful. I, place. I did my 13 years there. <laughs> yeah, I think we did. We may have met there briefly. We did. That's, I think, the first time I actually met you was yeah. at one of Stevens' uh, CE, CE5 uh, trainings. Exactly. Of I was the one that introduced him to the area and uh, have kind of regretted it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I say that in, in, in it was some jest, but uh, it was some. A, a bit of, of seriousness as well. Um, I, I, when we lost Sherry Ad, Adamack, who's one of my closest and dearest friends, uh, his managing director, uh, the whole C. Seti thing kind of lost its rudder, which uh, she was very forceful in, and uh, and and was the rudder of of C. Seti. Of course, Stephen was that uh, that big uh, that big engine there pounding away. Uh, low decks um but uh losing cherry in 98 uh was was a real was a real blow i think to to c seti and uh the old uh that big old tramp steamer uh that he was the engine for uh, kind of lost its rudder and i i really have a lot of uh, problems with uh many of the developments uh, along the c seti front um that have occurred over the ensuing 30 years and when people ask me about him i i, I don't like to, to to slag people uh but i do uh, say that i feel that his message is way more important than he is <laughs> <laughs> yeah i agree <laughs> so with, you know it, and and some of the free energy devices that uh funding was uh was solicited for and never produced uh uh hoaxing uh sightings 
for uh, event uh, for events where people are paying money to uh, to, uh, to to be trained to do things and have have uh, hoax sightings. Uh, it, 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 well, let's put it this way: uh, very well substantiated rumors of hoax sightings. <laughs> Yeah, there's um, a lot of controversy surrounding all of it, but yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> he's, he's, he's definitely a lightning rod for uh, for a lot of stuff, and uh, and you know, like I said, I you know when he when he offered me a free membership, uh, just, I don't know, it's probably ninety four. Um, I told him I had to regretfully decline. He says, "Well, it's a lifetime membership. You, you know, it's it's good. You know, it's." The highest level of memberships you can have and i said i wouldn't <laughs> Stephen, i wouldn't be a member of any club that would have me as a member so <laughs> <laughs> borrowing the old groucho line <laughs> was my uh was my uh deferral to uh to the to the much to sherry's uh horror she she just assumed that i would would, would take it but i didn't uh i saw the writing on the wall very early on um anyway uh moving right along yeah crestone great place uh <laughs> wouldn't uh wouldn't want to try to survive on the local economy and live there it's one of the poorest swatch county is one of the poorest counties in the united states i think it's in, it's in the bottom 10 <laughs> but it's usually it's top 10 right well, <laughs> in this case it would be the bottom 10. Yeah, right. i think wow. it's only a, a few counties in mississippi i think uh, are, are uh you know have a lower per capita uh you know i guess income level is how they judge these things um, it must have a low population yeah it does one person for every seven square miles <laughs> yeah it's uh it does have it's a, a cool place. place i ate at the roadkill cafe there so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah used to be the, the only one of two restaurants in 60 miles <laughs> <laughs> well no i couldn't say that about 30 miles um it's it's grown a lot uh when i moved there um, second night i was there half the town showed up unannounced at my house for a party because they heard uh, a musician had moved to town and that's where i met some of my uh my favorite people and, and best friends uh for a lot of years uh that night and uh it was 155 people uh, in the combined crestone baca grand uh subdivision wow. and uh i think there's hundred times that now <laughs> no, there's uh well it's not a hundred but uh i think there's 10 times that uh, about wow all well, right maybe, so, maybe more th three thousand so what i'm really curious about this is a question i like to ask all the guests and i warned you about it i'm oh, very yeah. curious about your childhood did you have any unexplained experiences i certainly what? did i'm an experiencer <laughs> i had non-human entities follow me around my my uh neighborhood at three in the morning uh in the spring of not sure if it was 65 or 66 i i was too young to really even think about writing these things down but uh i was either turning six or seven uh at the time and uh it changed my life it was probably one of the most uh important events in my life in terms of uh my reality view uh I, I i realized that um you know reality wasn't <laughs> everything that they were teaching me in school or <laughs> learning about in sunday school or you know reading about in books and and uh it did it did have a profound uh, impact on me and my thinking i became a, an instant closet ufo buff i found out really quick that uh you know i should just keep my interests you know quiet but uh i devoured every book that i could possibly find every magazine article every uh you know anything that had anything to do with uh non-human entities um, supernatural ripley's believe it or not all these types of things instantly became very important to me and and i always had my uh my eyes out and you know my feelers out for information about these subjects um at the time it wasn't so much uh ufos or flying saucers as we knew, knew them then uh it was more sort of science fictiony but more along the lines of 
you know, I, I, I factored all the paranormal subjects in as well. Um, no, I, I didn't know yeah. what they were. They, they, they now would be considered rec zeta reticuli grays or whatever, uh, which I don't buy into. Can you that. describe them? They were, see what you saw, hear what you saw. My my description of them uh, uh, that following morning to my family was I was stalked and followed around my neighborhood by these impossibly skinny stick men with huge heads, and um, I don't re recall their eyes. I think I, I kind of blocked out what their eyes looked like. Uh, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough. But they were um, my height, what three and a half, four feet tall. Okay. Um, they were they were holding out in front of them the three that I could see. Uh, there was one that seemed to be taller in the back, but it was more in the darkness. I could sense something something back there. But the the three in the front were holding out in front of them. Um, the only way I can describe them was like light sticks. They they had huh. multicolored light shooting up and down uh inside sparkling and that was just enough light so that i could see that um you know their arms and legs were you know like my thumb uh and and i it just was very unnatural and and uh initially a little disturbing did they follow you all the way home well i was in my bedroom i ran i ran upstairs ah. to, try to, get, to try to get to my parents room uh, and uh, they either teleported ahead of me and were at the top of the the second story stairs, or they there was another group. But uh, I left them behind me in my room and dashed up the stairs, hit 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 the landing, and went up to go up the. We had a split level house, so the stairs to the upstairs were there was about five stairs, I think, and they were already up there and. Uh, so I, I don't know if it was the same group or a different group. I have, I have a feeling it was the same group. Uh, of course, I first when I had woke up and, and saw them, I, I thought I was dreaming. And like any little kid will do, I'll hide under the covers, right? <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? Um, I was six, I think, getting ready to turn seven. Wow. Uh, either that or I was seven. I had just turned seven. And so I ended up... Uh, because they blocked my way up to to the my parents' room, I, they had an entrance in to their bedroom uh, in the backyard, and so I ran out the the kitchen door. And what convinced me that I wasn't dreaming was I had forgotten my dad had put the screen door on. It was like early spring, and I opened the door and ran out, and I ran right into the screen door, and ended up. I think I ended up on my keister basically, and. Uh, and I ran outside, and, and for they were either already out there. There was some reason why I didn't go around the back. I ended up going down the, the driveway, uh, going through the hedge to go to the Richards' house or next to our neighbors uh, to the south. And I was going to, you know, I banged on their door because I wanted to go in and use their phone and call. So these stick men are after me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, sounds, sounds crazy now, but... Uh, but uh, nobody seemed to be home, or they I couldn't wake them up, so... I looked down and I could see the tops of their heads. Um, the Richards had a multi-tiered lawn that went down and uh, with garden beds. And I could see the tops of their heads, but they weren't bobbing. <laughs> they were coming like <laughs> like gliding uh, wow. all in unison. And uh, that kind of freaked me out. And so I ran out in the middle of the lawn and I, I did my first my first uh, experiment as a as a researcher, I stood out in the middle of the lawn and waited for him to get under the the yard light that my my neighbors had, and because so I wanted to take a good look at them, and they they disappeared when they entered the light. They it's like they had turned sideways and had no depth to them, like like paper paper dolls or something. Weird. And that's yeah, that's 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 when I I lost it and and was became officially terrified at that point. And all I remember is banging on the the next neighbors over the Barker's door and banging and the light coming on. And that's the last thing I remember until my sister saved me. <laughs> like five houses away, four houses. Away. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. Uh, I, I don't know how I got there. I don't know how long uh, the, the people inside, the, the, the barkers, they they knew somehow that it was me. They could hear me or they, they looked out and they saw me somehow. Um, and they called my folks and said, you know, you're... <laughs> Your little boy is over here it's hysterical and so my sister <laughs> was the one that answered the phone so she was the one that that went out she didn't tell anybody it, 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 she just, wow she just came running over to, to save you know me from embarrassing myself and of course you know i, I it, the official family story diverts there and i was sleepwalking and i had a nightmare and all this which i've never had anything remotely like that before i've never slept walked what city was this in? Or, well, it, it, the thing that really struck my sister about how terrified I was uh, by the time she ended up finding me, which she said was about 20 minutes later, uh, I think it was longer, was that um, when I, I wouldn't go back down in my room. And so, you know, my sister was 18, so she was just getting ready to go off to, off to her first semester in college. And, uh, and she... Uh, she said, "Well, you can come sleep with me, and I'll I'll keep you safe, and everything will be oh. okay." And you know, and I, I appreciated that. Uh, but she said, she didn't tell me this till years later that I tried to nurse her uh, when I was in bed. So knowing a little bit about child psychology and 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 stuff, that that's a really good indi indication of of a very very traumatic experience. Wow, which um, has like I. I can almost say I remember it like it was yesterday. It, it was such a, a vivid experience, and and anybody who's known me uh, all these years, um, that's you know gotten close enough to me, that knows knows the story and 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 how much of a profound impact that it had on my life and my thinking. Have so, you had anything remotely like that happen to you since? I, I've had six hours of missing time in one uh, case. The, uh, I was out, um, actually it was uh, the day before I went to Crestone for the first time. I was out mm -hmm. in the Utah desert and mm -hmm. it was actually, actually two days because I would have to count the, 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 the night as well. Um, I was sitting in a car kind of standing guard with a rifle because we had heard these weird kind of pitter patter what seemed to be pitter patter footsteps outside that were going around the tent. I was with two city slickers who had never done any, any, it's the first time they'd ever been off, you know, off a, <laughs> off a pavement. And we were in the middle of this, you know, right smacking by factory butte in one of the most desolate, you know, remote areas of the United States and Southern Utah. And they were just terrified enough being there, let alone, hearing these little footsteps outside and so i i grabbed the the mag light and the rifle and i went out to see what was going on and i didn't couldn't see any footprints anywhere and so i figured i'd go you know listen to some tunes and and kick back and, and just the sky out there is just i think it was a no it was a, a bit of a, a moon out but not much you know, the sky was just just absolutely gorgeous um, you know, having been in, in New York and, and Boston for 14 years at that point, um, I, I wasn't used to seeing that, that real, you know, glorious desert sky. And so I'm hanging out listening to some tunes and I, I saw these, <laughs> something playing with me in the, in the rear view mirrors of the, the car. <laughs> and, you know, I'd look here and it would dip over here. I'd look here to, you know, it would go the other way. And it was like, almost like playing games with me. And so I, I rolled down the window and I turned on this big old, you know, the, the largest of the cop flashlights. And I, I looked at towards the back to see what it was and I couldn't see anything. And so I just brought my hand inside and then it, it was instantly, it was like the sun, it was two or three degrees above the horizon. And instead of it being one thirty-two at night, it was like six thirty-seven. <laughs> yeah. So well, I, I think, I think it was about a six hour, I think we figured it out as five hours and 50 something minutes or just, just under six hours of, of uh, time elapsed. And the, and the flashlight should have been out, right? It was blazing like, like it had full batteries. Uh, what did you think of that? I, mean, what was I the... turned the music down because I was listening. 
so I, I, I don't have any reference with the, the music that was playing. I think I was listening, listening to a cassette. It shows you how long <laughs> this was. This was April 89. Um, my butt didn't hurt. I didn't have any weird um, recurring dreams of... Uh, got that one right over your guys' head. <laughs> I know what you're talking about, yes. <laughs> I, well, it's whenever Moving. these yeah. types of whenever these types mm -hmm. of events occur, it's all oh, we're doing butt stuff now, right? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't. In fact, I forgot about it until my brother reminded me of it when I started, you know, researching and 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 running around investigating cases. And he um, he reminded me of it. <laughs> like I remember, he got just cold sweats thinking about going. Oh my God! Yeah, I forgot about that. Wow. And uh, and so um, other than that, that's it. I, you know, those two, those are my only. I've seen tons of UFOs, uh, dozens from, um, from childhood, or or until you moved well, to Colorado. My first, actually, my first uh, my first sighting was up in New Paltz, right during a a key weekend when Whitley had some stuff go on up there you know, un unbeknownst to me at the time, um, I was with a, a group that had a multi-witness sighting up there and, and then, um, nothing until it would have been 90, 91, I had a couple of things that I couldn't explain. I, I, I call them cheap fireworks. They're some sort of atmospheric. I think they're a natural piezoelectric effect, um, from the courts in the mountains there in, in Colorado. Um, you know, people say, well, you're just, you, you don't know the difference between a meteor and, and, uh, you know, a true atmospheric anomaly. And it's like, well, how do you explain seeing one arcing out over trees going out into the valley, lighting up the tops of the trees, and there's a uniform overcast sky? <laughs> it's not a meteor. Um, I've, I've had people call me and report them. And one guy said, I know it's going to sound kind of strange, but I swear Tinkerbell just crashed in the <laughs> backyard. Um, I don't know what they are. They look like fizzling out fireworks, uh, large, like big bottle rockets that are fizzling out. Um, I've had them seemingly within feet of me. Uh, I've seen them, you know, many times within a mile away. Uh, that including that one time where they actually lit up the tops of trees. And I was looking down at them because I was about a hundred feet above them in the, you know, I was in wow. the foothills looking down out into the valley. Um, so that was shortly after you moved. Over yeah. There, right. That, that would have been right. About the, about two years I'd been there. I think at that point I, I did, I think, no, the first one I saw right after I moved there, it's, I, I did see one. And that's, that's when I dubbed them cheap fireworks. I said, somebody's shooting out fireworks, come out quick. Cause I thought it was it was going up, and I thought we were going to see a big sheen, you know, and have the the, the wonderful flower, and and uh, and my my housemates came running out, and they said, well, okay, what, 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 what?" And I said, "That's gonna it flew over. It, it went shooting up right here. Someone's someone's shooting off fireworks, and uh, they look like kind of like you know when you when you go to see fireworks and you can see they're shooting up." And it's before they explode, but you can kind of see a rocket going up. That's what I they wonder. If that, like. I wonder if that is piezoelectric because you know there's the brown mountain lights and the Marfa lights, which I think are pretty no, much different. Turned. different. No, yeah, those they're are different. Yeah, those are close to the ground. Um, they they're generally location specific. These things you can see them anywhere, uh, going in any direction. They're different colors. They have different durations of how long they're visible um they never they're always moving quickly except occasionally when they're moving when they're shooting down and they appear to be coming at you then they they, they don't really move that much they just flare and get larger uh different different yeah it seems to be you know yeah those are not nice lights seems uh, to be pretty much confined to that area because i don't hear other areas um, I've, I've seen them further south uh, in New Mexico. Um, I've seen them once or twice in uh, 
something, if not that, something similar um, around Four Corners. But yeah, it, it does seem to be something that that's more. Uh, it's more along the Songres, where, where you have the second largest rift rift uh, valley, you know, the thrust fault oh. there, um, and also. Uh, you know, of course, all the amazing quartz deposits that are in the mountains. I've seen the quartz actually discharge all the way up the, the range at one one time. Oh, wow. But that's when it's super cold and super dry, single-digit humidity. When if you're scuffing on the ground, the quartz on the ground will even spark just in the dirt. Oh, um, amazing. So, yeah. Yeah, Tesla supposedly was going to go study him, but he never, he never made it down from Cripple Creek. Um, he had heard about the you know, the blue light that would sh shoot up from the uh, mountaintops. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how my my investigator side started, you know, really becoming extra vigilant when I started seeing these things. Um, and then when I had my first daylight sighting, that was, that was the crucial one because it was only 150 feet away. Um, 50 feet off the ground, went right in front of the car. Uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, absolutely impossible to. <laughs> not what, what did it look like? I mean, and uh, it looked like something out of the Jetsons. It looked like a, like a little airplane with no no real tail on it. It had like something back there, but it was going so fast, it was hard to s determine whether it was a cupola or maybe a tail or some sort of, some sort of bulge on the top of it. Um, yeah, it, it looks like Brad has pictures of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I did a complete, complete research project trying to find any sort of U, U, UAV that um, at the time in '92 uh, would have you know had the same sort of look as this thing that I saw. I wasn't driving, so I got a chance to look at it the whole time. It was visible for about seven or eight seconds as it shot across the Werfano Valley, which is the valley on over the other side of the Song Great Cristos to, to the east. And it's also a, a low level flight operations area. So I, I always assumed, uh, or I assumed at the time that the La Vida MOA, military operations area, which is where we train all our um, Air National Guard pilots and, and we rent out the airspace to, to other uh, nations, air forces. The Israelis train, train there. Um, the Germans, uh, there's others that have been there training, but um, I, I just assumed since it was a, a military operations area that it was uh, something, you know, maybe secret, but not high strange. Although looking at it shoot out across the Werfano, it um, it looked like somebody reeling in a, a, a fishing lure where you, you reel in the lure real fast and it kind of skips. Kind of how similar to what uh, Kenneth Arnold, you know, called the saucer uh, skipping on on a pond. It had that kind of action, but it was skipping like this, you know, away from me, uh, and, a, and, a, and it was skipping, kind of staying on the same level horizontal plane. But but there was variation. It was dipping and shooting up and diving down, but but moving away really fast, and. Uh, that was September of 92. And then that was right at the beginning of one of the, I think, heaviest periods of activity any region that I know of has ever seen. Uh, I, at the height of it, five years later, I got 17 sighting report calls uh, in a single day, five different events, 17 witnesses, which was wow. the height of it when, when it got, when it, when it really. When so I was calling people saying, you got, I need you here. I need help. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start like officially investigating? I mean, um, well, it, it was the, the 200 foot ovals coming down over town uh, and going out over the valley at, at uh, in the you know nighttime that um, out of 155 people, 18 people saw these things uh, as it turns out. And uh, unfortunately I wasn't one of them. I was gigging with my band in some little town across the valley and i didn't get a chance to see them but i i it was that was december 9th uh 92 which would have been uh 
what three months after my daylight sighting but but i um i had a new year's Eve band, party. by the way <laughs> no that's right that's four five bands later oh, okay uh, <laughs> that one <laughs> no, that's, the, that's the that's the band that i'm currently in it's okay <laughs> not 30 years ago i looked way different back then <laughs> um, uh, no it it was it was right in 93 then that i i started seeing things you know myself and i started uh, you know investigating as well but i i had a new year's eve party new year's eve 92 um and uh at one point everywhere i went the party little groups of people were all talking about a ufo sighting and so i kind of started listening in and and it was obvious that they were talking about the same thing and, but none of them knew that other people you know and said well you saw it really oh I, I thought i was the only one you know and i go in the next room and i'd, I'd see the identical conversation take place i go into another room and the same thing was going on <laughs> wow. it, it, it turns out there were 12 people at the party that had seen these these uh, objects and, and another six that i found on top of that um from you know referrals by by people that were you know in the party and so that's that's when i started my investigation that night i thought hey you know one of the people said oh they had a mutilation that night down in costia county and i was like well that's it i'm gonna write an article about this this is too good to pass up you know i was gonna write a jokey article about all the you know the the old retired hippies are all having this you know the, uh, sp spontaneous uh acid flashback all together i was gonna kind of do a fun funny the kind of thing that i very soon after <laughs> hated when the media <laughs> <was>. <laughs> i was gonna do that and poke fun at all these people and stuff and and you know i had two weeks to, before i had to turn the article in so i started digging into the newspaper archives and sheriff's department's reports and you know the sociology department at the local university and you know some of the people that would were involved in aviation and the military in the area and stuff and i i had enough material in two weeks to write my first book uh it was just unbelievable the amount of stuff that i i discovered and, and uncovered that i can't really say i discovered it i i, I just uncovered it uh that uh you know with a little just rudimentary journalism you know i just pre-internet you know i was going through newspaper archives and and sheriff's uh files you know and uh and because quite a number of these individuals had also seen things they had kind of made note of where some of these files and stuff were so it was easier for me to even uh even more so uh to get this uh, information because because there were some people that kind of you know secretly had a, had a fascination with all this stuff and especially lynn weldon dr lynn weldon at adam state college at the time um he had been saving articles since the 50s about stuff that happened in the valley and oh wow and so you know i i just had all these people uh linda moulton howe uh, tom adams uh, gary massey uh, Leo Sprinkle, uh, just a bunch of people. They found out somebody was living in this valley where Snippy the Horse happened and all these sightings happened. That finally somebody's there that can run around and check all this stuff out and investigate it. I had so many people helping me out simply because I was there. <laughs> and I was the first person since the 70s that had even expressed any interest in the stuff. And so so I had all these you know big brothers and, and a, a big sister to help me you know, bringing up the speed and, you know, how to properly investigate, how to properly interview people. And I mean, all this in two weeks, it, it was just amazing. And my article, instead of being 500 words, it was 1500 words. And it got picked up by all the news wire services. So instantly amazing. I was, you know, I was on Unsolved Mysteries two months, you know, they, six months later, they came two months later to, to film me because you know i was running around checking all this stuff out looking like i knew what i was talking about because i'd i'd had you know 20 you know 30 years of of experience reading these books and knowing the subject you know matter inside out I, but at this point i'd read all of keel all of valet um 
I think I might have even read one of your books by that point. When was your first book out? Oh gosh, 1996. Okay, so it was it was before that, but um, I was definitely publishing articles at the time. And we yeah, were yeah, the UFO yeah. Universe was definitely and, and, and where I got my start. I read some of his stuff, Bob Ecker, uh, and, and Vicky, uh, some of their stuff. Um, you know, Timothy Goods stuff, Frank Strange's, uh, the Scully, all you know, all the classics. Um, so with that sort of immersion in the subject matter and the, with the help of real professional researcher investigator types, I was brought up to speed incredibly fast. And so when, when that first article came out, it, it was like, I couldn't believe how many people tried to contact me. Uh, and this again is all pre-internet. Uh, <laughs> I remember Lou, those days. Lou, yep. <laughs> Lou Farish's news clipping service. It came out in that. I, I had to get a larger mailbox at the post office <laughs> because of all the mail I was getting. Wow. But, and um, and you know, I, I was getting reporters from Europe, South America. You know, when when the Associated Press, United Press International, and Reuters pick up a story, it really that used to be the way that you got the word out. Is is to somehow get the news, the wire services, the news services to pick up your article. I didn't know that that they had picked it up, and so <laughs> it, I couldn't figure out how do all these people. Make <laughs> Back in those days, newspapers they're a little bit more open to UFO articles too. Well, the Crest Eagle only had less had two hundred and fifty subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> and so I I found out that. AP picked it up, and because they did, everybody else did. So Amazing. you kind of dived um, right into the deep end there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, the, you, you said you said a good thing. I, you know, I, I was used to being on stage and, and having uh, having you know people looking at me while I'm I'm having to perform and and you know come up with with parts and stuff. And so you know, I kind of took to it pretty pretty well. And at the time, I was a you know, a good looking rock and roll dude. So, you know, it all was perfect water for the <laughs> for, for the the shows and, and the and the magazines and stuff. And uh, you know, I ended up having to move because of it. Uh you know, yeah. when van loads of Japanese tourists are stopping outside of your house in the middle of BF nowhere and photographing your house and then zipping off before that you run out and chase mm -hmm. them away. <laughs> you, wow. you know that you've become the story. <laughs> What was your most fascinating case in those days? Which one? That's that's impossible. Stopped you I, I, no, no? No. no. <laughs> what's what's the best uh, the fizzy you've ever had, or what's the best <laughs> cupcake have you ever had? Uh, mm -hmm. That's why I write books. Um, it's impossible. I've had scary cases. Um, mm -hmm. I've had, um, you know, it's it's just I I really can't can't answer that. Um, Did you ever have one that just made you want to stick through it even longer? Like there was just more to the story and you wanted to, you know, lay your hands on more information, that kind of a thing? Well, kind of Snippy the Horse. Yeah, Snippy the Horse. Uh, out of all the cases that I that I researched, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be the one because I, I, I found, I saw the International Enquirer front page in, in you know, the fall of 67 with the headline, the quotes from Nellie Lewis saying, frying and saucers killed my horse. And when I saw that boy, I, I threatened my mother with everything that I could think of that I wouldn't get grounded or, or spanked if she didn't give me 50 cents so I could buy the Enquirer. Oh, wow. And she absolutely refused to buy that magazine, any magazine but that, you know. Uh, she hated the Empire. And the it was one of the only ones that would publish. <laughs> that kind of yeah, story. it was, and it was a Bob. I think it was was a Bob Pratt, and no, I think it was even before him. Uh, I I talked her into it. I, I threatened to you know to go on strike and not do my chores and but you know I I used every means of of manipulation in my power as a ten year old. Uh, that was a major, also a very major point uh, in my life because I remember thinking, "Wait a minute, if these if these 
little guys or what I saw from these craft. And these craft are coming down and doing that to a head of livestock. Uh, you know, all bets are off. You know, we really need to be paying attention here. And I remember devouring that article. And I, I dragged it. I, I still had it by the time I got to college. Um, wow. So, yeah. so what, what, at what point did you decide, you know what? I need to write a book about all of this. I mean, here, here's your first book right here. Let me see, pull that up. This is your, really, this was your first book, right? Yeah, and it, it it went through ten printings. It was a it was a quite a good seller for St. Martin's Press. I mean, I got a, a major publisher deal. Um, like I said, right right around the end of those when when the, all those uh, letters and all the interest came in, that combined with all the information that I was able to to uncover so quickly. Um, that convinced me that, 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 you know, not only was the subject incredibly visceral and powerful, but a lot of people were interested in, in potentially, you know, the things that were going on in the San Luis Valley. And, and there was just so many good, good reports and, and good documentation, uh, you know, stuff that you could sink your teeth into and, I, you know, I, my first two books, I got 157 release forms signed, legal forms, people saying, you can use my my name, including wow. the dozen, 15 cop, you know, law enforcement officials. Wow, yeah. that's pretty unusual back Very then. Very unusual. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, you know, I, 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 people found out right away that I was, I was honest, that I didn't embellish, that I wasn't out to sensationalize. That I've honored requests for anonymity, that I credited in my sources, and people just opened up to me. Whether it was the local UPS driver with incredible sightings that he videotaped, that he said he was never going to show the videotape to anybody, but you, I'll show it to. <laughs> wow. So, do you remember uh, any specific cases that stick out, like landings or any? Yeah, the the landing out at Valley. Um, um, it's, it's called uh, Joyful Journey Hot Springs, but back then, before it got built, built up, and when it was just a, a concrete hole in the ground, it was called Valley um, uh, Mineral Hot Springs, right where the two main roads in, in in the valley come together and converge and go out out the southern end of the valley, right near where Robert, uh, um, the guy that wrote the uh, UFO and Nukes uh, book. Oh, Hastings. Robert, yeah. Robert Hastings lives uh, within just a few miles of there. There was a landing there. And uh, the one thing that I really regret never getting um, is a, a copy of the footage. Um, my brother saw it. And um, by, by the time I, I heard about it, um, I had been gone. I came back to the valley and saw the footage that he had taken, which is, was quite amazing. Uh, my my brother described it. Um, the guy that was with him described it. Evidently, the caretaker out at the hot springs she had seen these lights come down uh, pretty close, a couple hundred yards, I think, away, three hundred yards maybe away from the from the building that, that the caretaker lived in with no electricity or anything, real rustic. And uh, and she went out the following uh, morning, and there was a landing what appeared to be landing traces there with a a blast hole and there was a snake <laughs> in the blast hole wow. standing on its on its tail with its head kind of checking out you know towards up towards the towards the the rim of the hole and uh an nbc uh camera <laughs> named steve jambeck actually videotaped when he when he and this guy heard about it he went out there and not thinking that you know the snake would be there, you know they thought there was just some aberration. The yeah, the vibrations brought it up. The snake was probably looking around, going, "What the heck?" <laughs> well, well, the snake yeah. was there for three days, yeah. if I remember. Yeah, and, well, and my so brother so thought you'd be looking yeah. every day too. <laughs> he went out there thinking, "Oh, it's never going to be there," and it was there. <laughs> It's crazy. Animals are funny that way. I'm not kidding. Well, it's really out of the ordinary. They're like, oh, snakes can you know? stand on their tails. Wow. <laughs> They're periscoping is what I call so it. So that, that was a good one. Um, and then later, this is quite quite interesting. Later, 
um, I got my first real abduction case in, uh, let's see, this landing would have been the summer of, of 92. Okay, well, can you, hold, can you hold on for a second sure. before we get into that? Because I do need to take a quick station ID yeah, break. Okay. And I just want to let you all know that you are watching The Light Gate. I am your host, Preston Dennett. My lovely co-host is Dolly Saffron. This is episode 37. And our guest tonight is Christopher O'Brien, an experiencer, author, researcher, one of the experts on UFO waves, and certainly in the San Luis Valley, also on unusual animal deaths. He's been the go-to guy for many, many years. And we are airing live on United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM from the beautiful city of New Orleans, in Louisiana. Also, UFO Paranormal Radio Network, 105.3 FM. Of course, on several other platforms, such as YouTube and Roku and Facebook. So thank you all for joining us. We're now starting our second hour. If you have any questions, please be sure to put them in chat, and we will get to them if we can. We already have a couple lined up, so thank you for that. And, yeah, I am excited to hear some about some of these <laughs> we haven't even gotten into extensive it. cases. <laughs> we're, still, we're still stuck in before I even started <laughs> investigating. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, not many people ask me about the, about the early stuff. Uh, I don't get a chance to talk about these things very often. I haven't talked about that snake in the blast hole weirdness for, and, and that. Well, I that, loved your book, by the way, and the follow-up to it. I mean, this, yeah, this yeah, is it's riveting in, it's stuff. In Mysterious Valley, it's in there. Um, and it's not just UFOs. I mean, it's, all kinds of stuff. Oh my God! You, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot going on there. But yeah, yeah. The, the second book is all the a lot of the research that I did, which which uncovered the treasure legends and and the weird aberrant social behavior and the strange weather and weird things that happened in in, in the area over the years. So, you know, folklore, you know, phantom trains and and haunted sites and. The Thunderbird. I remember Thunderbird, you had a couple of Thunderbird big, stories. Big, Bigfoot stuff. <laughs> Native American legends. And, and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I had uncovered enough in two weeks to write two books, you know, which I ended up, I tried to, they said, when I sent off my proposal, I, I didn't send off the, the chapters or even the names of the chapters of all the research. I just sent out all the, you know, the current stuff. But I had also, you know, did a whole book basically on <laughs> all the research of the treasure legends, haunted sites, Native American stuff, Bigfoot, um, all, all the religious miracles, just all that type of stuff. I, I, I wanted it to have it in my first book, but they only contracted me for 70,000 words. And they said, when they got the manuscript, they said, uh, what part of 70,000 words did you not get? <laughs> you know, we didn't ask for, you know, a, a seven, 800 page book. Uh, here's, here's how this is going to go. It can go one of two ways. Either we take out 70,000 words and decide that that's going to be your first book, or you can. Which would <laughs> rather it be? <laughs> How hard was that for you? <laughs> when Preston writes, if he has to erase or get rid of anything, he almost cries. <laughs> He's like, my babies, my words, oh my God. Exactly. <laughs> that was rough. <laughs> yeah. But, um, well, you know, I, I, I got not all of it, but I got a lot of it in the second book. So wow. um, so it worked out it worked out well. The second book didn't take long to write. Let's put it that way. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, tell us about some of the onboard experiences where people are taken on board. Or well, yeah, yeah, I was uh, talking about the the um, uh, Valley uh, uh, Mineral Hot Springs. Um, this woman, I got referred to the case by uh, the county sheriff, and um, and the dispatcher there had been asked uh, uh, to call me and give me this woman's contact information because they felt that she needed someone to talk to. And she was un really unwilling to, to reach out to, to anybody herself. And her friend, the dispatcher said, you know, you, 
I'm going to give your name to this guy. And she had heard about me, but then she did took, she with quite a bit of reluctance, she, she agreed to sit down and talk to me. And um, good thing she was had a journal because some of her journal entries lined up perfectly with sighting events that, that happened in the Valley, excuse me, which was real com good confirmation for me because her story was so wild. It was difficult for me to believe some of it. Um, she was part of a, a third, she was the third generation experiencer, uh, started with a grandmother, uh, possibly earlier than that. Um, the, she grew up in Denver. Um, she had gone down to the valley pretty early on and the phenomenon followed her. Um, she was in a personal relationship with one of her abductors, uh, and she said that they actually she, they actually became lovers, and she um, she became impregnated by this uh, alien gray, if you will, the tall tall gray. And um, she said that uh, to get over the difference in body types between the two of them, he would wear capes, and. Um, she really liked it. She loved it when he wore his, his golden cape because she said it was like Golda May. She said, because it reminded her of Elvis, <laughs> <laughs> which is one of the most bizarre quotes I've ever heard from a. There are lots of accounts of people seeing capes on entities. I mean, if you go through the literature. Oh, yeah, there's tons of turn up. <laughs> yeah, a Golda May cape that made her look <laughs> like Elvis. Yeah. I, I almost lost my coffee when I was drinking coffee when she mentioned that. I almost spewed it all over the table. Um, she said that, she says, you know, you, you know where uh, 285 and 17, you know, state highways come together and then you draw a straight line to the mountains. Mm -hmm. There's some, some deposits of, what did she call it? She called it trilithium that's there. And I said, well, you mean lithium? No, no, it was like three something, you know, try three lithium. I said, so it wasn't dilithium like in Star Star Trek. She goes, no, I never seen that. I never watched that show. <laughs> I said, well, in Star Trek, there's dilithium crystals, which are used as a power source. She goes, no, she, she says she's positive that they would come down and they would get trilithium there. And she didn't know that Valley View Hot Springs is 98% lithium water, <laughs> which <Wow. laughs> at least she claims she didn't. Uh, <laughs> not many people know that, uh, you know, uh, back then, prior to, to the California folks coming in and building it up and making a big deal out of it. Back then, it was just 140 degree water that you hoped uh, you could, that it had, it had run long enough so it cooled off so that you could get in into it. 140 uh, degrees, wow. Well, it comes out of the ground at 140, and then it runs uh, down a kind of a, it's almost a permanent sort of pipeway that runs uh, from the source to um, the actual tubs where they have the, the hot springs. Where, and uh, by the time it gets there, it cools off quite a bit. But back in the, back in the old days, um, it, you could go all the way up there, and it would be too hot to get in. Are you talking about? Where where is this place again? What state? Oh, Colorado. Yeah. Oh, okay. They have something like that up in Warm Springs, Georgia, too. And uh, yeah, lithium hot springs are, are really, there for therapeutic reasons. Yeah. They were prized all the way back. You know, the Egyptians and the Greeks uh, talk about uh, hot springs that that turn out to be lithium. Uh, it's let's put it this way. Whenever we would all agree that we were going to go up there and somebody was going to drive, we would have to do rock, paper, scissors to just, you know, figure out who was going to drive because nobody liked to drive once you've been up there. Because you once you just a half hour soaking in there and it's not not by accident that they use lithium uh, to sort of sedate people yeah, make, they, make, lithium if you're bipolar uh yeah. they use lithium on yeah, people yeah. and it is is sedative it's very much a sedative it, yeah it's, it's, it's yes. like doing drugs going in that right exactly yeah and nobody liked to drive afterwards 
Uh, <laughs> and so we would we would literally, you know, we would argue about who was going to drive, uh, who, <laughs> who was going to drive. I should say. Um, so anyway, that that particular case, getting back to the to the your question, um, that was an important case early on, with the snake and 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 all that, and and um, and and Sally, the wonderful woman that lived at the hot springs then. Um, who 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 died a, a an unfortunate uh, early death? Um, she was just so matter of fact about it. It was like, oh yeah, we see lights like that out here, you know, pretty pretty much all the time, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, what? You've only lived out here for three or four years. Yeah, we could see lights out here pretty much all the time that I've been here, and 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 the other people that lived out there as well uh, had stories and and stuff and and. But at the time, you know, I, I I hadn't really caught the bug yet. Um, it wasn't until I had my daylight sighting and and we had that major sighting of the the two hundred foot ovals and the mutilation happening the same night. That's that's what really kicked it off for me. And and uh, and so for for the next well, from ninety two to two thousand two, man, I I was full time. Um, I put three hundred thousand miles on my car and. Or my truck in in uh, smokes. In six years, um, it, it was you know. Well, I was also gigging too, so you, you got to factor some of that in. But uh, when you're covering a a ten thousand square mile valley, uh, <laughs> you tend to put miles on your vehicles. I was sixty miles from a nearest stoplight. So, what do you think it is about that that valley that is the draw for so much? I have no clue. clue. <laughs> I have no clue. Um, it's it's the same, you know. Why why when you go to a town, and you go to the highest house on the highest hill, does it have thousand a thousand bees nests? Um, I think it's the the same kind of answer. It's America's attic. It's it's the, the the backbone, the spine of America, and it's it's the high ground. It's it's you know, it's like uh, the highest house in the town. All the bees want to be there because it's unobstructed, you know, flight paths. Uh, to wherever they want to go, I painted the highest house in Somerville, Mass, uh, which is a the sub suburb directly north of Cambridge. And um, my brother and I had a painting company for a couple of years, and we we painted uh, we started painting the house, and we realized we we just couldn't paint it because there were so many wasp and hornet and and some bees nests. The bees tend, tended to be. <laughs> the house is a little bit lower. They get chased away by the by the by the real nasty aggressive um, bees. But they pulled five hundred nests out of that one house. Um, and uh, jeez, I mean, yeah, that took, was possible. It took, it took the <laughs> bee, bee man. Well, it was a big, big Victorian uh, four stories. It was a huge house. Um, it um, it it's it's the high ground. I, I think that there's some something to. Um, you know that spine of America, why the Rocky Mountains tend to have a lot of sightings. I think that could be one of the reasons. Is it's the high ground. Um, I also think it's it's the it's very similar to the physical makeup of of Wilshire in England and other hotspot areas where you have alternating layers of water, mineralized water and uh, clay and sand um, in alternating layers. It's almost like a you're creating a, a, a huge natural battery uh, that, that could be some sort of, have some sort of energetic, uh, some sort of en energetic characteristics. Um, well, that's and, an interesting observation because, you know, Topanga Canyon, where I grew up, ended up being a major hot spot, And we have that, a big aquifer, lots of clay, huge quartz deposits. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any place you have those things and, a major earthquake fault. Anytime you have those those elements, you're going to have a hot spot area. I have a uh, this. It's kind of a. It's sort of a short list of things to look for if, if you want to become an investigator. Um, if, if if you can find an area that has those following um, elements uh, there, that. Um, Chances are, uh, you know, I, I, I'd bet money that you're, if you start digging, you're going to have a, you know, a, just a, a wealth of, of research material to, to refer back to um, of this types of activity and haunted sites and 
other things, Native American sacred sites, uh, you know, uh, lay, potential ley line or earth, earth, uh, earth uh, energy uh, type. Yeah, well, that was one of the really interesting things I thought about your research is looking back into the whole history of the place with the Native Americans and the ant people coming out from the sand dunes, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And it's not only UFOs. I mean, do you think it's all connected, the religious miracles and all the yeah, ghosts? Yeah, I, I, the... I, I, I do. I think it's, it's uh, as each, um, you know, kind of generation of people cycle through a place, they put their own interpretation based on their level of, of technology and their understanding of technology that um, they're going to be placing, you know, a, a up, up to up to speed, up to date uh, interpretation of what they're seeing with their descriptions, um, what we're flying seed pods and flying shields and flying spears and canoes in Native American lore are now our modern, uh, you know, flying saucers, uh, you know, whatever type of craft that you want to want to describe. Of course, Jacques Vallée's most important book, I think, um, uh, pa pa Passports to Magonia, uh, goes into this whole idea that, uh, you know, these these elementals, these leprechauns, these fairies, these uh, trolls, um, you know, alekes, it depends on whatever culture you go to, there's always stories of this kind. And that's what my stock in the tricksters book is about. You're always going to have um, these trickster forms that um, fly around, abduct you, uh, you know, bugger your cattle, uh, you know, create all sorts of havoc in, in your life if you're not in tune with them and um it doesn't matter where you go you're going to find these these shapeshifters and that's what ties them all together um is that they have the ability to shapeshift and um i it was not i the first time somebody did it it <laughs> kind of sat me back in my chair but i got used to people calling up from the hispanic south end of the valley calling up to report a ufo sighting but they they are reporting a witch um huh. and and that's how witches would fly around in the valley according to the traditional folklore as if they were in a hurry they would get into a fireball transmute themselves and shapeshift into a um an energy form that they called you know fireballs and that they would shoot across the the desert uh in in various uh, configurations of of uh fireballs and that's how they if they had to get from point a to point b quickly they would do that if they weren't in a hurry they'd be a raven <laughs> you know wow. so um yeah i think that there's there's a, a, a direct correlation between the the type and in, in a mountain and intensity of folklore uh of an area and it's uh you know how much of a hotspot area for for ufo activity it is in the, in the current current time frame yeah well there was certainly some of that going on in topanga canyon i noticed there was a oh, lot yeah. of ghost activity there was a religious miracle spot down in malibu nearby well, yeah, didn't, a, lady uh, described a ghost dog with who, who was it uh, david uh, he was camping in his uh, parents backyard uh, david serrata and said uh, a, a, a ball of light came into his tent and became Jesus and anointed him or something. Oh, wow. Uh, I haven't yeah. heard that one. Yeah, David, uh, I know Sarita. David Sarita. Yeah, I know who he is. Sarita, yeah. 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 I had him tell me the story. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that where, that's where he got wild. his little, uh, interest. Well, I remember one of the cases in your book, which interested me particularly. I don't know if you remember in any detail because – when you do this stuff and you have case after case after case, <laughs> it's I also a little have a bit overwhelming. Memory too. But uh, you you called her Barbara Benara, I believe, and it interested me because she was healed of yeah you know, cancer. Her, her, I believe her name actually was um, it it uh, she finally died of of a um, a bad case of lupus brought on by. Lyme disease, but um, oh, wow. she was, she claimed, and um, she had been sick with cancer and had been undergoing 
some treatment for it, but they had said that it was uh, to advance and, and that there was no point in continuing it. And she, she healed after these supposed encounters with uh, the little brothers, I think was how she called them. Her, her name was Owlish and she was the, she was part Native American and had been married to the custodian of Cisna Jenny, who was the Navajo custodian um, that would help Navajo do vision quests there. Had a couple kids with him and then he, he freaked out. He couldn't take it and she didn't want to leave. He, he wanted to leave. And, and so she was there. And this was right about the time I met her in, in 90. And um, she was, uh, my, my girlfriend at the time was, was doing some healing work and helping her out and stuff. And that's when she let it slip to her that she had been, had these visitation uh, events happen and including one that happened right uh, during the time that I knew her where she was dropped off at the end of, uh, of uh, what people commonly refer in the, in the neighborhood there as Two Trees Road. Um, all the way out in the valley next to where the old Baca Grant ended and the Baca Ranch began. Um, yeah, she, uh, she was, that was one of my, uh, atmospheric friends, as I like to call my, my ungrounded, um, kind of new age, uh, Crestone friends. She was one of my, uh, my atmospheric friends. Um, and she actually did very well for, a number of years after that and then she said that her um her contacts had had uh, by that by about a year after the first book came out she said that they inexplicably had stopped and, and she didn't know why she said they had been fairly fairly frequent but uh the contacts ended and then uh within two years and she started slipping i, I don't know if it's yeah. You know, well, we'll figure uh, if if there's some sort of correlation time wise, but uh, but she was a very sweet lady, and and she raised uh, some some really nice nice kids. Um, it's very but, interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of healing cases. So I'm always interested in that aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, if I hadn't known her, I wouldn't. I wouldn't probably wouldn't have given her the time of day, but. Uh, but because you know, I did know her, and, and my uh, my girlfriend and her were real good friends, and she confided in her. It was kind of one of those things that was sort of a secret. And then, like, are you sure you don't want Chris to know? And okay, well, you can tell him. It was kind <laughs> of like one of those type of deals. And of course, you know, when I said I was writing a book, she freaked out and said, "There's no way you can use my name." And um, so that makes so you wonder just how much you're not hearing about if you're getting all of these reports out of one area. Oh, well. Just you asked me if I had had any other uh, encounters. I, I do think I had one. Um, I, I think I had a whole group of them come through my wall, into my room, but they were they were invisible. Um, like just the other side of, of invisible, because I, I definitely kind of caught some ripples in the air, almost like heat heat waves coming in hmm. when they came in, and I I, I could have sworn I saw a. a a um a shoulder fourth dimensional think. rift fourth dimensional rift yeah something like that. that yeah if you want um uh, although i wouldn't go with a a dimensional thing i think it's more of a vibrational a frequency that we're just slightly out of out of uh out of phase with our particular limited frequency realm that we can perceive um but um and there was no question in my mind something was there and i and you know every hair on my body stood up and and uh, i even at one point felt that there, there was one that was right in my face that leaned down and got in my face and and i wanted to wake up my girlfriend uh, in fact i did she didn't particularly notice anything uh, and she was quite sensitive um and then they left they were only there for i don't know maybe five minutes if i remember and I remember I wrote it down. I, I was really was so struck by it. I said, there's no way that, you know, I hadn't been asleep. Um, I was kind of tossing and turning, wanting to go to sleep uh, at, at, at the time. And uh, What year was that? 
I'd have to look. I think 94, maybe. Um, I don't quite remember the date on that. But what I do remember is I did write the date down. I did write a description. And uh, two weeks later, a woman said, have you talked to, you know, so-and-so, who was my next-door neighbor? Have you talked to her? She had a visitation. And uh, this woman was married to a very, very famous psychiatrist, author, uh, who was much younger than he was, world famous <laughs> guy, who I, I cannot use his name. And um, they had a little little son. Uh, and then shortly, shortly thereafter, he, he died. He was quite actually pretty, pretty old at the time with this young wife, 30 years, 40 years younger than him. And so they had a little boy who was gifted. And he was, at one point, right around this time period, he was five. And he was saying, Mommy, the earth's going to shake again today. And somewhere there'd be a major earthquake. And somehow she was convinced. She would start writing all this, his prophecies down. And within days or hours, he would always be right on. And um, so anyway, this woman friend of hers heard her heard this story, and she says, "You have got to talk to Chris. You know, he he may know something." And and she said, "No, he, I he, I don't want to talk to him. He's the last person I want to talk to. If this gets out, you know, it could could be terrible." You know, she was so so nervous about you know being public, and so she said, "Well, let me talk to him and, and see what he has to say, and and I won't tell him who it is." And I absolutely guaranteed you know her anonymity, and that I would honor her her request for anonymity, and I wouldn't violate that. So she agreed to tell me because it was such an important event. She said that these a group of these little grays came in and. She said they totally ignored her, but they were absolutely fixated on her son, who was in his little bed. And she said that they were not all there when they came through the wall. She could see through them. And they came in, and she could see through them, but they seemed to be a lot more present. Um, but they weren't totally uh, invisible. And... Um, she surrounded her, her she go, went and got her son they moved out of her way she if i remember she got her got her son and surrounded him and herself with white light and and basically we just kept saying over and over again if i remember correctly you know if you're not the light leave you know let us be protected and so um <laughs> all of a sudden i i, I said well Wait a minute, when did this happen? And she goes, two weeks ago. <laughs> I went, oh, no. It happened 20 minutes after my my event happened. They, they came and visited me, and then they went to the next house up, up the hill from me uh, to this lady's house. And uh, and that's that's pretty, it's beyond coincidental, <laughs> I think. <laughs> wow. it's, so they, they came and checked checked in on me. It's all in the book. Whatever whatever I wrote in the book is right from my you know my my notes. Uh, like I said, I have a semi photographic memory. Well, I just got a message on Facebook from Dennis Whipple who says that my first sighting in 1976 was a ball of yellowish orange light off to our right at night while driving through San Luis Valley. Stayed with my friend and I for at least five solid minutes, then just went out. Told you this, Chris. At MUFON, and you said, yes, you and hundreds of others. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's amazing that there's so much confirmation to a lot of the cases you investigate. You talk to one person, and everyone else is like, well, I saw that too. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, you go to the valley now, and everybody goes, oh, we don't have anything happen here since you left. You know, they, they, were, they were coming here checking you out, and you're, you're the reason why all this stuff happened then. And then you, you talk to somebody else that, you, that that hadn't just moved there within the last 10 years. And they go, oh, yeah, stuff goes on, but uh, not like it was in the 90s. I mean, in the 90s, it was nightly. It was, I mean, I had five sightings myself personally, five sightings in, in one single 24-hour period. I think it was my record. Oh, um, and like I said, there were 17 uh, 
reports, 17 phone calls. Well, I'm going to ask you a question that I ask everybody who has um, uh, something in common with you. Uh, do you consider yourself psychic? Not <laughs> really. Um, I feel I, I, I've I've been around this stuff so much uh, in and out, you know, throughout throughout my life. You know, I've been to some of the most haunted sites in America. Um, you know, I could go down the list of, you know, my bucket list of things that, that I've done and, and experienced. And I wouldn't say I was psychic. I would say that I have a really finely tuned antennae. Um, and and it's you more than a few, in, few intuition. Few yeah, it's it's intuition, and it's also um, it's also a a physiological uh, you know sensory device. I mean, I, I can I can tell when there's something going on. You no, know, that's what makes you psychic. You have a pineal gland in your head, and that's your connection possibly. to it. Yeah, yeah possibly. Um, yeah. You know, I can't I can't look at somebody and go, "Oh my God, quick, go home, you're gonna die." You know, <laughs> you don't go home now, you're gonna die. This, yeah. Well, everybody has varying degrees of house. ability. If you exercise it, um, you can develop it. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, and I I have done some of that. I've, I've you know, I have a pretty extensive magical training, uh, mm -hmm. in Western esoteric tradition, and um, and other types of energetic manipulation, uh, and and the ability to perceive particular types of energy. Uh, you know, I've been trained as a remote viewer. Uh, you know, I could go down the list of things that that would that, definitely make you psychic. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't make you psychic. It, it'll it. You're psych you can do it because you're psychic. That's a like it's like a check a checklist. You know, it's like can you do this? Yes, this, this, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 can, yeah I would psychic. say that. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't claim to be psychic. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, so I, I read. Uh, I was a professional tarot card reader. I learned tarot when I was a kid from my my, <laughs> my adopted mother. She taught me, you know, pendulum dowsing, and and um, uh -huh. she doused my brother as well. Uh, okay, she was incredibly gifted dowser, better than the professional dowsers that, that the Rocky <laughs> Mountains are known are known for. The water witches. Every single you know, people don't know this. Family, in other words. Pe people don't know this, but boy, if there if you want to drill drill a well in the Rockies. You got to have a really good water witch because you don't want to spend money to go down 200 feet and not have have a dry well. You need right. to have somebody that can tell you when there's where there's water. And when the water witch came out to do my brother's house, he said 60 feet you're going to hit good water and or, or no, he said um, six, 68 feet you're going to hit good water and, and you're going to have to go down to about 80 or so. And uh my mother had already been out and doused the property and had had told him he's going to hit really good clean water at 60 feet right in the exact same spot so, <laughs> so <laughs> you know I, I i grew up with a very liberal education uh you know i i was exposed to all the stuff from a very young age so i've always had a, a sort of a predilection to, to all these sorts of things uh I find it interesting among researchers, you all have a predilection uh, amongst you. you know? No, I know some researchers that are actual boneheads. They don't have really? a psychic bone in their body. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> most, most of them, we'll most, most of the ones that I know that I, I hang out with or, you know, pick their brains, they, they do. Although Nick Redford, I don't think he, he would, he would say he's, he's a, I don't think he would say he was psychic by any stretch. Hmm. Um, have any sort of inclinations or abilities or tendencies in that direction. Um, Nick Redfern's notoriously, uh, uh, well, it, you know, it, there's a number of people that, that uh, are in the field that I think are, are uh, as psychic as rocks. Uh, <laughs> I agree, actually agree with you there. It just depends. I'm opinionated yeah. about this, so I'm going to be gentle here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> that are definitely are, no question. Real, real, real. Some of you are really good empirical researchers. In other words, yeah. you've stated this very clearly. You write what you know. You yeah. you don't 
add the add the things you put it down as you see it and hear it you document everything i, I, I stick to what the facts can demonstrate that's right yeah, a that's good why. researcher is that way then there yeah. are sensationalists then there yeah. are people well, who are just yeah. wanting the notoriety or whatever and 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 they're the dumbest rocks ones as far as i'm concerned because they're they're they bone in their things. body they know better than to be acting that way so and yeah. like i said it's just my opinion. well i've always i've always felt that since it's such a touchy subject matter to begin with that you've right. got to be any wobble in, in the force any sort of observer <laughs> yeah. effect that you're going to introduce into the into the equation is really going to create problems and that's why mm -hmm. you know 35 years later here i am uh, you know with my reputation and my integrity completely intact and uh you know the, yeah. some pretty pretty serious people have have uh either publicly or, or not so publicly supported my work monetarily and otherwise uh you know billionaires don't fund sensationalists <laughs> let's put it that way. No. <laughs> right. and when they do they want to know about the other people that they're funding to make sure that they're not sensationalists because they have a sneaking hunch that some of them are <laughs> so yeah. you know well, what what I'd like to do is put pop up some questions from chat. Sure, fire Just, away, man. Um, I, I love the, that's my favorite part of the program. Yeah, and some of these are a little off topic, and I knew this was going to come up, and it's been mentioned a couple of times in chat already, because the internet, of course, is all a buzz about the recent Bayside Mall alleged sightings, and Jan January 3rd, was it, of ETs. I am skeptical. Hi. I actually believe with what octopus with friends is saying <laughs> people with fireworks mistaken as gunfire no proof of a single thing i haven't heard any good reporting on it i i haven't even heard about it so <laughs> it shows <laughs> how in touch how psychic i am <laughs> i think everything is um uh, alarming to everybody now and it's like the chinese balloons you know they're Everybody wants it to be a UFO situation. Everybody, because now they know that there is a serious situation with that and that they exist. Now they're going to see them everywhere. It's like, oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. Oh, no, it was that, you know, and people will yeah. just talk. And uh, it's not good when that happens because. I, 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 yeah, I have a lot of lot of problems with uh, yeah. with with that aspect of this field. In fact, I many people consider me a debunker because um, I, I just like you know if the facts don't hold up and if there's not a body of evidence to corroborate you know an event or right. some 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 aspect of of a report or whatever um i i just i can't i can't go with it you know and yeah that's why i wanted to have you on we're pretty picky about who we bring on to the yeah, show I, I'm, I'm, I'm a real tough nut uh you know, if I if I wrote if my database is a hundred pages long of very small type, and it had to have eight eight points of data to get in there. <laughs> so, um, it's if I included every story that you know nobody had a you know that somebody didn't have a date for, for mm -hmm. instance, or um, family stories or stories that they heard in school or wow i heard this story so and so had this happen and if i can't get so and so to come forward and say yeah it doesn't doesn't make my database right. and so i'm really proud of that database it's it's got a lot of law enforcement um, officials it's got scientists um it's got ex-military it has you know people that are pillars in their community mayors of towns heads of, of livestock boards, uh, you, you know, people like that who are unimpeachable. And if they're willing to go on the record and tell you something about a high strange experience that they had, I'm going to, you know, that's going to make an impression on me, especially if I have other witnesses that have reported something similar from the same area. What's wonderful about the Valley is there's, you have perfect sight lines. There's nothing obstructing your view uh, you know, for 140 miles, you can see 300 miles in the valley because yeah. the tops of the mountains that you're looking at sort of negate the curve of, of, of the it's earth. Straight out of that advertisement for Close Encounters with the highway leading off into the endless yeah. distance. It looks yeah. just and like so, that. <laughs> so someone, someone can have a sighting 60 miles south, 80 miles south of you, and 
you can see that that event. It's going to be right above the horizon instead of being directly overhead, maybe right. for the person down exactly. there. But you're able to cross-reference and cross-correlate events so much easier. Uh, it, it's so easy there to do that. And that's one of the things that I had really working for me in that when you're in a semi-arid desert, you don't have a lot of, <laughs> with only one person for seven square miles, you don't have a lot of trees and buildings and, and, and you know, hilly terrain that's obscuring your, your view of the horizon. It's one of the only places that you can go where you can see the horizon uh, from, or you can see the Milky Way from horizon to horizon. And, uh, and that's one of the things that I just never will will uh, ever not, uh, you know, kind of pine for is that those unobscured views out there. I mean, that's just so the, the night sky out there. You know, I was lucky I, I smoked cigarettes and wouldn't smoke inside. So I was always outside and constantly people going, how come you see so many things? How come I don't? I said, because I look. You're outside. You're looking. That's right. I'm outside. I'm looking. You're, you're so many children who are witnesses and police. You're <laughs> <watching them. laughs> All so, right, okay, well, shoot, shoot another one at me. Yeah, here, this is, of course, bound to come up. You having been pretty much the go-to guy. Oh Clarice God. Davidson yeah. is asking, this is a loaded question. <laughs> what do you know about the animal mutilations and who and why is it being done? Well, if there course, is something to be known about animal about mutilations, that. you're looking at the guy that now is probably knows more about it than anyone. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, David Perkins, my mentor and and uh, my research partner, and you know, comedic straight man, and and just best friend and stuff. I just lost him uh, in August. Uh, just so so bummed about it. You know, every every day I miss him more and more now. He used to know more about it than me, and now he's gone. So <laughs> by default. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I say I know everything I do, even stuff that I don't want to know, I know, uh, it, which in, includes a lot of the animal pathology and the forensics, you know, the forensic science and, and stuff that you, you just, it's just not for everybody. Uh, and, um, you know, I think there's multiple groups involved. I think aliens are the least likely group to be involved. Although we can't, thank you, you're can't, right, you're exactly correct. We can't factor them out, we can't factor them in. No. If they're not doing it, why aren't they stopping the ones that are? Uh, or who yeah. is? Uh, so I don't, I'm not a believer in aliens, I'm an experiencer. I think that we're dealing with life forms that have been on this planet longer than we have. Yep, they're more terrestrial than we are. Um, the reason why they started showing up when we started popping off nuclear weapons is we were putting them in, in, in arm's way. I've been saying this for 35 years, and now it's starting to become, I saw Bernard Klostrup, what's his name, the scientist guy that writes articles every now and then. He, he just came up with an article that, well, oh, we should start looking at the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis. I said, where are you mm -hmm. at now? <laughs> I had a, a, a long conversation with with um mac tones back in the in the early 2000s and he, next thing i know he's writing a book on on crypto with uh, crypto terrestrials he, he he came up with a new word and then was able to almost write a whole book about it uh um this is something that i've been i've been uh, pretty pretty adamant about i don't think we're important enough for anything out there to come here uh, I think that we're, if anything, there's a do not, you know, disturb sign and, uh, you know, avoid this place at all costs. You know, they, they, there's probably rules and regulations in the cosmos to stay away from us, from this violent, misogynist, you know, primitive, absolutely, you know, knee-jerk, violent place. Uh, just look what's going on in, 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 in Gaza right now. Uh, so getting back to the, the mutilations, yeah, I, I, I know everything that there is to know about it. And, and I've written the only book that objectively looks at the mystery and I'm very proud of it. 
it took 22 years to research and 18 months to write um it, it was not easy to write it almost turned me turned me off to writing uh period although i'll, I'll continue doing book covers i, I love my my cover <laughs> i want to tell you something um we're probably the same age we're doggone close um were you born what year were you born 57. okay i'm one year old uh, younger than you i was born in 58. And uh, the first time I saw a laser, you got to understand, I grew up with scientists, okay? And I had access uh, to things that not no, not many normal children had access to. The first laser that I was shown, I was eight years old, seven or eight. I think it was wow. in the second grade, so I would be seven. Yeah. And I, I remember, vividly remember, and I also have an eidetic memory, by the way, uh, that this was being developed for surgical purposes or for uh, other purposes, yeah. military, but surgery was the one that they were expressing to us as children in, in this class that I was in. Yeah, I'd love to say that all these are, are done with laser surgery yeah. or yeah. beams. Well, I'm also a registered nurse and I know a lot about medicine. And yeah. no, they're, uh, not, they're not, they're not. They're sharp. Applications and, and what you can do with a carcass or an animal that you're Let's not even go with that description, but see what I'm saying? And it's the vast majority are done with a sharp steel or carbide um, cutting instrument. Right. But they can electrify it and they can ca cauterize instantly. That's out of all the cases, surgical technique. Only had yeah. two cases, two yeah. cases that, uh, out of 40 or so that, that, that yeah. I know of for sure that, that high heat was involved. And uh, that was because we there was evidence along the incisional line of, of cooked hemoglobin and yeah. um, and what appeared to be cauterized uh, uh, cauterized uh, All right. Well, we just have a, we yeah. just have about five or ten minutes left, so I want to pop in a few more questions. There aren't a whole lot, but here's one that's very personal, Chris. <laughs> Uh, and JB39 is asking, perhaps you've covered this well, and I missed it. Only one time. Only one time, yeah. <laughs> Have I, you ever uh, had an out-of-body experience? One time, yeah. When I was when I had was shaken out of bed by an earthquake after my mom had brought me a book because I, I was sick in bed with a flu, back visiting uh, the Seattle area for the first time after moving the year before to New York, where I ended up staying for, for 12 years. And... Uh, I was going to stay back in, in Seattle, and um, I, I worried myself sick over it, I guess, um, and I didn't feel well. I was kind of in bed during the day, and I asked my mom to bring me a book. She brought me a book that was a the most boring scientific book about what, what it would be like to be in the Seattle area if a major earthquake would. Oh, the, no. The sub, you know, the sub. Uh, How prophetic was that? Yeah. Right. And I got shook and I had the book on my chest and fell asleep. And I got rattled awake by an earthquake. Well, I came, my, I moved back to New York. Uh -huh. ah. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't need to be very psychic on that one. Uh, and that night, the first night, as we were driving along the, the, the Dalles and uh, those beautiful cliffs that overlooked the Columbia down there uh, in Northern Oregon, um, that night I, 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 I asked for projected. And just barely, the the top of my my tent held me back, although I could see see the stars through it. And the realization of that slammed me back in my body. And yeah, and uh, yeah. my uh, sister and brother in law, who I was traveling with, were in the tent next to me. And they said it sounded like I got uh, run over by a truck. The <laughs> the sound I made when I came back in, and they came racing racing over because they heard they thought something had happened. And I told them what it, you know, what had just happened. They said, "Oh man, here you go again. Are you sure you weren't seeing little stick men?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ribbing is horrible. I've, I've and never, you haven't tried to do it ever since. I I have. Um, I did um, the the Monroe uh, Hemi Sync uh, tapes. I, I I tried a, a number of times, but I, I didn't stick with it long enough. You know, I've got enough going on in this body. <laughs> so talk to Preston. We have you walking out in a day. I'm not kidding me. Really, yeah. just like have a I private love that topic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't really, uh, you know, all the stuff that involves me personally. I, I, I'm having, I'm having a tough enough time just dealing with my, my regular, you know, run of the mill boring life. You know, it's, 
I, I moved the, to I the only place where I <laughs> had no mutilations. I'm in New York. There's never been a case here. <laughs> Another question I wanted to ask, which I just find it fascinating, because there was that whole incident on Greeny Mountain with a possible UFO crash. Oh, yeah, the NORAD event. Yeah, what do you oh, think man. of all of that? Can that was one of my it? favorite, favorite, favorite cases. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, there's a two two hour time dilation. Um, the impact and the sighting, or the impact, the noise, and the in the the actual uh, uh, physical effects of the event, which was a few acre sized fire, happened two hours before the sighting event, which happened exactly to the second two hours later. Now. I'm, 120 minutes uh, it's an arbitrary you know figure i understand but a retired fighter pilot from sac one of our you know most decorated uh, strategic air command pilots saw the five to seven uh, battleship sized objects that came in and he plotted them on a on a map to come down right where the norad uh DSP spy satellite saw a few acre size fire, which was being manned at the time by Ron Regeer, who is, has now become one of my dearest, closest friends. He was working that day and was monitoring the, the DSP feed and just happened to, to, to be there when, when they logged this few acre size fire on the backside of the DSP spy mission. Um, when he comes over, over, the U.S. they they look for you know aberrant, mostly fires, um, and they thought it was like some forest fire that was starting up, and they immediately called the uh, county sheriff, uh, real uh, real Grand County, and said you got to get up there and, and check this out, exhaust all efforts, you know, planes, land, and and air, and so they as they're going up there, <laughs> Norad calls back and goes, oh, we gave you the wrong coordinates, it's twenty miles this way. And they're like, what? And so they they did an about face and went 20 miles away. Of course, there was nothing there. And where the original coordinates were, where the SAC pilot uh, did his figuring where the objects went down, that's where a, a bunch of witnesses saw, you know, pretty impressive UFO sighting and uh, just the weird um, low-flying uh electrical uh sort of spy plane b-52s retrofitted b-52s were flown over the area there was temporary fencing there was convoys of military vehicles took something out of there um this was to, to me the dark horse the most important ufo story of 1994 and nobody i mean i i tried to get people to pay attention to this how often does norad call up and report something that, that turns out to be a you know, battleship sized flotilla of, of, of objects that creates a few acre sized fire and then, you know, calling, you know, search and rescue, you know, from a county to go check it out and then telling them it's elsewhere and having two people. Now, this is rumored. I did, I did get confirmation on one death, but, but two people that were on duty that day at NORAD died mysteriously pretty quickly after the the fact including a woman who was pregnant had just gotten her her second bar she'd just been um, promoted from lieutenant to to captain and she may have been on the in charge of the in charge of the the shift that was on but boy i got slammed on shut trying to that's the first, that's the first time i've ever talked about that publicly i got slammed dunked on, on that trying to figure that out to uh, get confirmation on it but that was a that was a huge major major event uh, that happened. I even got a chance to fly over the area um, a couple three weeks later um, in a helicopter, and and when we were on our way back to Crestone, it was a little two man helicopter. Uh, I ran out of batteries. I'd been videotaping, uh, and and I looked over at the pilot, and he's got his eyes half closed, his hand hands behind his head, and he's steering the chopper with his his knees. And I, I had noticed him doing this. I said, what are you doing? I thought helicopters are hard to fly. And he said, no, it's easy here. And he opened his knees up and he, he the chopper started wiggling around. He says, 
keep your feet off the rudders and go ahead, have some fun. So I got to fly the helicopter and I'm I saw the herd of cows and I was buzzing it and kind of did a little bit. I kept going in a straight line. I just buzzed the herd. And, oh, and on the next day, somebody brought the Rocky Mountain News over and said, Wow, there was a black helicopter uh, stalking a, a herd of <laughs> Yesterday, yeah, and I'm looking at it, and then I look at the time, and <laughs> the sheriff tried to catch me, and a couple deputies chased after me, and oh. and uh, I was reported as a well, it was a dark purple helicopter, but anything dark against the blue of the sky is going to look black. So I was actually reported as a black helicopter, you know, harassing a herd of cattle. I still got the article somewhere. Well, unfortunately, Christopher, we are out of time pretty much. So I right. wanted to give you a chance to or promote anything you wanted to promote. I, I, I don't do that. I don't promote. Right. Uh, just just we'll promote become part book. of the solution, UFODAP, U-F-O-D-A-P, UFODAP, the UFO Data Acquisition Project. We're now up to 88 installations around the world with multi-sensor, um, with I think 15 multi-sensor Data acquisition packages uh, with recording, uh, you know, event tracking and motion tracking software for cameras, and uh, you can get your magnetometers hooked in, you know, up and run your your uh, radio frequency spectrum analyzers. We've got uh, uh, gravitometers, accelerometers to see if the Earth's uh, gravity has shifted during the sighting event. We're on four continents uh, in 20 some countries and uh, 21 states as well. Wow. Uh, UFODAP. Thank you, Chris. Very cool. Yeah, well, oh. thanks very much for com coming on the show. We, there's so much thanks we have not cover. You have to have me on about 10 times to even begin to talk. Yeah, well, we're going to do that. We're going we're gonna to get some more dates out of you. So. <laughs> if you don't mind, we would love that. We just lick the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for watching yeah. my gate tonight. Bye-bye. Thanks for having we me We love on, you. Uh, we were broadcasting to you live from the beautiful city of New Orleans in Louisiana at 107.7 FM on the United uh, Public Radio Network and UFO Paranormal Radio Network at 105.3 FM. I want you all to have a wonderful weekend, and we are going to get Chris to come back. Bye. <laughs>